before I get started real quick, uh, I have a little cleanup to do and that's expressing my thanks and appreciation uh, to all the directors and uh, boy, the many faces I see in this room that were precious to me, they're seated up here on the front row. Uh, I thank them and like uh, Craig said, Dr. Cooley and Dr. Frazier, it, it, it warms my heart to see Dr. Frazier participating at our meetings. Uh, Dr. Cooley commonly presented uh, at our meetings with the Academy and he would just show up because he wanted to. And so I think that was a wonderful, wonderful attribute in him. And every time I look at that picture of Diane Clark and Charlie with the uh, reading Clark textbook, I always think the expression on Diane's face is, did we really write that or something? I can't figure out what they're talking about. <laughs> but anyway, and uh, there were three of two, there's three of my classmates here, including myself. Uh, let's see. I'm right there. Doug Thompson, Penny Giddings, she's here. And then, unfortunately, two of my classmates are deceased now, Joyce Bigley and Corey Singer. Uh, uh, so we were voted the most outstanding class in the history of the program. <laughs> Not. <laughs> Chris will contest that. But anyway, all right, my, my uh, presentation is titled Past and Future of Perfusion Technology. And I think everyone in this room will agree with me. It is inextricably interwoven with cardiac surgery. I have no declarations or no conflicts of interest. So uh, having gotten that detail out of the way, I'll start by uh, looking at that very topic, medical ethics, bioethics. And for 500 years, you know, through the classic Greek period, Hellenistic age, the Roman age, the emergence of Christianity. There was one unknown disputatious pre-Hippocratic -Hipp writer who wrote, I am utterly at a loss to know how those who prefer these hypothetical arguments ever cure anyone. I do not think they have ever discovered anything that is purely hot or cold, dry or wet, Rather, they impute heat to one substance and code to another. It is my opinion that all that has been written by sophists on nature has more to do with painting than medicine. He wasn't quite ready to adopt the uh, Hippocratic uh, oath and the uh, Hippocratic corpus, was he? But anyway. Uh, we have greatly improved on that, as you know, in the last several years, modernly. So if I don't accomplish anything with this presentation, my greatest goal from in compiling this, and this is not a technology perfusion lecture. It's a, hopefully a motivational lecture and mainly for the students, the younger people, 10 to 20 years into your career, and encourage you to unravel a modern day myth that perfusion technology is dead. And if you think I've been uh, drinking or smoking something, that's not true. I'm gonna uh, hopefully convince you uh, of this uh, very thing that I wish to impose. I begin with the stagnation of science and the fact that many writers in history have wrongly characterized the myth of the dark ages from 500 AD to 1500 AD as a period when academia, scholars, scholastics, and uh, so on and so forth, forth were uh, sort of not happening and asleep, you know? If you look at the fact that Columbus confirmed the earth was anything but flat, that was pretty monumental discovery. Uh, the most uh, wonderful discovery occurred in anatomy in that period, beginning with uh, Leonardo da Vinci, whose uh, anatomical drawings were discovered 300 years after his death. 
And he, just, he was the first to describe coronary artery disease as a cause of death. And he described the heart valves and the great vessels prior to William Harvey. His, his work, as I previously stated, went on for 300 years and not uh, noticed. So uh, his heart drawings and his anatomic drawings were just magnificent. And as uh, Craig said, Marcello Malpighi, he discovered in uh, 1661, as you transition to the Renaissance era, Malpighi uh, discovered the capillaries, the, the missing link in Harvey's uh, uh, discovery of the circulatory system. Harvey didn't have the benefit of a microscope. And so uh, he never connected the two and Malpighi uh, made the monumental discovery sitting in the courtyard at Padua, the University of Padua. And I, I actually have been to that school and enjoyed touring it. And the, when at sunset, the sun was just right and it wouldn't blind his eye with the mirror. He was able <laughs> to see uh, the capillaries in frog lungs. And here's a topic we don't tend to like to talk about in our profession, but yet we do when we have to. And uh, it continues to haunt us. Uh, Francesco Ridi in 1667 was the first to uh, publish on the fatal potential for vascular air embolism. Others contributed in this regard in that period. You uh, recognize a few of the names at least. Uh, Valsalva, we hear that every day, but yet in 2000, Muth and Associates <laughs> described air-related injury mechanisms, and I thought they did a great job. If you get a chance, read their article. It's listed up here at the top of my slide, but um, they proved that it wasn't solely just occlusion causing ischemia in the brain uh, and uh, uh, the subsequent neurologic injury. It was a uh, variety of factors, including temporary occlusion along with secondary thromboinflammatory responses at the sites of the air injured endothelium, and then uh, ultrastructural and functional structural uh, complex interactions among bubbles, blood, and the formed elements, and endothelium with fibrin deposition. And you see the two pictures of venous reservoir there. That's the damage done by failure to ameliorate venous line and trained air. And uh, I discovered this and took a picture with my cell phone. And uh, uh, I couldn't wait to go to the hospital the next morning and confirm the lady uh, had not had a stroke or something of this nature. She was doing better than I was. She was sitting up in a bed extubated. I mean, sitting up in a chair extubated, which thrilled my soul. Oh, okay. Now, it is true if you read the history of our profession, 17 of the first 18 patients in published medical literature. There were others that weren't published, but uh, about a 94% death rate or mortality in the first 18 patients that uh, were placed on cardiopulmonary bypass. And air embolism was the most common cause of mortality. And I always attribute this to uh, the fact that it was the birth of our profession. The surgeons that were in training, others, uh, maybe anesthesia, uh, residents or something that were operating the heart-lung machine, they were more interested in other things, but one day uh, uh, it happened and uh, perfusionists and their career was born. And if you think that our work is done, this, per, this uh, cardiac surgery in the world is uh, done and complete and over and things like that and dip down into the doldrums, Look no further than 310 million people undergo a surgical procedure annually around the world. 
and it's in a very good study, 474 hospitals in a seven day period uh, involving 44,814 patients. Medical error was uh, uh, one of the most alarming things that they uh, realized from this study. One in six patients developed in hospital complications. One in 35 of those died. And if you extrapolate the numbers out, 50 million patients annually in the world experience some form of complication in hospital and one and a half million die from these complications. So what are your goals in perfusion? What are your goals in managing the heart lung machine and applied physiology? I think look real hard at that. I have a, a, think a, a series of calculations that I do on every single patient. I'm not gonna bore you by uh, belaboring that, but uh, the symbol of uh, star of hope and guidance is something I use to motivate myself. You have things that motivate you. And I go through calculations, identifying the patient's uh, body uh, composition, because body composition uh, is a major factor when you start considering how you're going to conduct the act of perfusion. I look at their renal function. I look at their colloid osmotic pressure estimations. And we learn all this from the pediatric uh, perfusionists. I take notes when I go to hear them talk. And so think about how you can improve your uh, conduct of perfusion by looking more deeply at yourself. I do this for not publication purposes. I've studied a hundred patients and uh, what can I glean from looking at that? It's a self analysis, but yet it could be institutionally uh, evaluated as well. 68% of the patients I do are anemic. And it's hospital acquired anemia. I don't even worry about looking at the hematocrit until the uh, final uh, or the initial ACT after I run on systemic heparinization and a concurrent blood gas. What's the crit five minutes before I'm going on pump? And I guarantee you 68% of them are in the range of 26 to 32. And what do you think the uh, predicted dilution rate is going to be versus the actual dilution rate? So we need to clean that up. I don't, you may do a better job of that than some of the places that I have worked. It, it's something that we need to uh, apply in goal directed therapy. And it's beginning with the patient's admission to the hospital. There's no excuse for, uh, uh, not paying attention to detail and infusing in the pre-op holding area, area a liter of crystalloid fluid and oh my God, the drip rate wasn't managed properly, you know? So uh, I think there's work to be done there. All right, the 20th century, if you look at 1900, the, leading, the heart disease was the fourth leading cause of death. I commonly use the eighth leading cause because you have to back out all the various infectious diseases, tuberculosis, diphtheria, and so on and so forth. And it actually moves uh, closer to uh, eight, but it's the first century in which uh, uh, cardiovascular disease was the most common cause of death in the United States. And it may well be the last century between now and the end of the current uh, period, uh, like he stated previously, what's it gonna be like in 2053? I won't be here, but maybe y'all can shout at me up above if I'm there, <laughs> hopefully. But anyway, uh, it may well be with all the progress that's going on in medicine that I'll elaborate in a minute. So, Cardiac surgery is dead. Really? Right about the time I reached the age where I should be uh, making life choices and health decisions, you know, and, uh, 
I'm not willing to admit that. And I don't think you will be either if you look at these numbers and I'm not gonna read them all to you, but 5 million people suffer congestive heart failure. 550,000 patients annually are new, newly diagnosed with congestive heart failure. Every 40 seconds, there's a myocardial infarction. And if you look at all the other figures, uh, Deb will have this presentation. You can go back and look at the numbers. And I'm not convinced cardiac surgery is dead. I'm, I'm going to elaborate on the modification process we're going through, but there's no question about that. And I'm not in denial. Uh, today's statistics, the younger people, there's 7.5 billion people in the world today and 6.65 uh, uh, have smartphone and 85% of Americans own a smartphone. That's up from 35% in 2011 when it was introduced. The point being relentless innovation is what got us here today by cardiac surgeons, perfusionists, manufacturers, and uh, all the people involved in uh, how we care for our patients. And by the year 2030, you at least have uh, eight more years. By uh, 2030, cardiovascular disease will be among the uh, three leading contributions to disability adjusted life years. 65% of death around the world will be due to cardiovascular <clears throat> diseases. So I think as I state here, relentless innovation or the lack thereof will dictate your future. And you guys uh, getting ready to graduate and uh, so on and so forth need to really uh, be involved. Don't sit back and wait on others to do it. Jump in and get your feet wet. Uh, we're better today than we were previously. Our systems are dramatically improved. There's no question about that. We uh, need new manufacturing ideas and clinical research. And then the question I have for people like me and others, what are you and I going to give back to the schools to promote research? Oh, uh, something. And I'm capable of giving, and I need to be doing that. What is your idea as you approach retirement or enter retirement to make a bright future for these people in this room that are uh, going to take on the challenge of uh, treating us in our adulthood in the advanced years. I want them well funded. <laughs> okay. The, who are the faces of innovation here at Texas Heart? I think we all know the answer to that. I, I think that's, uh, our, it's Dr. Cooley, Grady Holman Sr. And I think Domingo Leota when they did the total artificial heart in 69. And then Bud Frazier, of course, as uh, Craig elaborated. I'm not going to re read the numbers to you. My God, they're staggering. I think Terry said they've done about 125,000 open hearts now. Uh, sequencing the human genome took nine months and $100 million to complete in the year 2001. Today, it can be done in 24 hours for $1,000. This is the area I start delving into for the future you're gonna see uh, genomics practiced in medicine where massive data uh, coalesce and uh, you're gonna see nanotechnology, you're gonna see artificial intelligence, smart technology, and our manufacturers need to keep our heart lung machines and us plugged into this. I'm not smart enough to do that, but I know every one of you are. Uh, the STS database, when you look at the year 1960, there were 10,000 open hearts performed in the world. Now look, since 1989, there's 7.5 million uh, cardiac procedures registered in the STS database with 3,800 physicians participating. So man, just look at the explosion. 
And if you think that's dying, you know, I, I don't know how to comprehend that. And the way we were, we have made dramatic improvement in 1952. 46% of deaths were due to cardiovascular disease. 30% of heart attack victims did not survive. And if you look at Dwight Eisenhower, while he was president of the United States, he had a STEMI heart attack. His treatment consisted of amyl nitrate, morphine, and that's it. Bed rest for about a month. And uh, there was no cardiac cath available to him. There was no EKG and all the various hospitals. He was in Denver on a golf outing when this took place. The hospitals didn't have an EKG machine. And so pacemakers and everything else were yet to be discovered on the horizon. And if you look at John Kennedy's quote, victory has a hundred fathers, defeat is an orphan. He was referring to the Bay of Pigs debacle, but uh, I apply that quote to uh, cardiac surgery and who gets the credit. You know, there are monumental people that made discoveries from 1897 to 1988. And I'm not gonna read the slides for you. You can do that for yourself, but uh, I don't think that this profession is dying. Are you convinced more so now than before I started talking? Good. We are redefining our profession. We're in that process right now. And it's a very young profession. Heck, it's only been 58 years since daughter performed the first peripheral angioplasty. It's been just a short period of time. If you look at all these events that took place, uh, uh, it's just amazing what we have done in a short period of time due to relentless innovation. If we let innovation die, I can promise you, you're not gonna be happy with your future. But the next 25 years will be challenging. Cardiac surgery, I think, experienced complacency in the coronary bypass era, what we refer to as the golden era of cardiac surgery, uh, people kind of got complacent. They didn't think it was gonna go away. And then all of a sudden uh, the term PTCA, drug eluding stents and so on and so forth started emerging in the late, in the early eighties. Uh, uh, then I don't have to tell you the rest of the story because you're living it today, but that, that uh, stent or drug eluding stent doesn't cure coronary artery disease. Coronary artery disease still exists distal to or proximal to the stent and the gold standard is coronary bypass and the syntax trial of uh, angioplasty versus uh, uh, coronary uh, bypass surgery we won that argument, but it's just a deal where in the future, this very topic here may sensitize you, Taver or Evar. Pathology is eventually going to define how people are treated in cardiovascular illness. There's going to be corroboration and collaboration. You're not going to just admit a patient, go straight to the cath lab and uh, boom, do what you please. They're going to have to be pathology guided treatment where maybe the patient has a disease condition that uh, makes surgery the more preferred treatment versus <clears throat> angioplasty or drug eluding stents. None of us want to have our chest split open. We should applaud the fact that in the future, 75% of the aortic valves will be done by TAVR, most likely but they accept less standards for results than they do by the open aortic valve method. But yet we still will be doing 25% of those valves. So we cannot uh, fail to look at that and maintain preparation. New horizons, as I have alluded to, and then I'm almost done with you. Uh, artificial intelligence are on the new horizon merging in the genomics and uh, 
the period for uh, introducing the smart applications that all of you guys comprehend where uh, you'd have to sit for hours with me and try to explain how to do some of the things you do uh, with this technology right now. So you wait until it's applied to genomics, disease, and so on and so forth. It's gonna be staggering. And working in concert, we're doing that right now in the uh, cath lab or hybrid operating room. And the one statement I'm gonna make here and move on, you'd be the best standby perfusionist that you can be for these procedures. I know of a case today in our institution, the uh, catheters were too large for the uh, iliac artery. And guess what? They had to open the patient. You gotta be prepared, read the patient's chart, know their history. They're more advanced in their disease phase than uh, what we used to do when we did 5,000 open hearts. They didn't take the memory back then. But uh, things have changed in our patient profiles. So be the best you can be at everything you do. And you probably won't have to worry about your career. And so uh, the modern myth uh, give us a chance came to my mind and associating just a short period of time when all these accomplishments took place. And uh, I think this is my last slide. Uh, what will carry you into the future? You've heard that from Craig and now you hear it from me in person. Uh, of manufacturing, demand, innovation, and more and more of yourself demand no sacrifice of clinical responsibilities. You know, once you give something away, you don't get it back. And then uh, uh, this is not a career of convenience. Never even consider that, as Craig alluded to with all the events in his personal life he missed. Of yourself, be willing to accept new roles and improve old ones. And then be active in your uh, support of your profession. And I mean, that is something very important. Don't go for the next five, 10 years and just accumulate your CEU credits and not be involved. That's not gonna help your career. Get involved and be uh, active. And then if you sit idly by, the one thing I can tell you with certainty is uh, I guarantee you your vocation will die if that's what you choose to do as a professional. So be the best heart team member uh, that you can be, and I'm done. Thank you.